testing Tengok ada tak? Ada keluar rasa Tak Sekejap cuma buat view Nanti saya tengok saya tak tahu Saya tengok saya tengok Dengar saya Nampak saya tengok Hai Dr. SJ Hello? Kenapa berjumpa? Oh sebab masalah ni buka
Assalamualaikum. Hi. Can you hear me? Dr. Kawaiwa, are you there? Yes, SJ. Yes. One more, Doctor. I can hear you. Hello. Oh, okay. Hello, okay. Uh, we, uh, we wait, uh, kita tunggu dulu dalam beberapa minit. Tunggu, uh, uh, apa orang panggil? Kita punya audience masuk. Ya, yeah, Doctor? Okay. Okay, can we start now? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon. Hello everyone. I'm Siti Jalilah. I would like to welcome all of you to our Akotro Postgraduate Talk on Research Publication. And our guest for today is Dr. Kowai Ho, who will give his talk entitled How to Write a Manuscript Worthy of Publication. To begin our ceremony, let us recite Al-Fatiha. Okay. 
Okay, uh, before uh, we start, uh, I want to remind all of you, all of our, our audience, please fill your attendance uh, using the link we sent through the chat box. Um, and okay, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Ko Wai Ho to begin his speech. Okay, Dr. Your, the stage uh, is yours. Please welcome. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, SJ. So you can hear me? Hello? Yes, I'm yes. 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 Okay, good afternoon to all. Uh, I think SJ, you can start to uh, help me share the slides. Okay, thank you, Dr. XJ. So, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, and thanks again, XJ, for the kind introduction. So, welcome and thank you, everyone, for willing to spend some of your time to attend today's short sharing session. So, I am Dr. Ko Wai Ho from Aquatrop UMT. So if everyone is ready, I think uh, we can start now. So today we are going to talk a little about publishing. So since publishing papers is a requirement for all postgraduate students, where in UMT Master, you have to publish at least one paper. And for PhD candidates, you need to have at least two. So every one of us must have to publish manuscripts sooner or later. Now, everyone can come up with a manuscript. It is easy. And every one of us knows the basic concept and also the drill. So a, a manuscript has a title, abstract, introduction, method, results, discussion, and conclusion. Now, these are the basics. The results and discussions can be combined or they might not be combined. Depends on fields and journals. But not all manuscripts especially manuscripts that are written hastily, manage to find their way to a journal. So today, I'll be sharing a little on how to write a manuscript that is worthy of publication. So a short, a brief um, publication track of mine, I graduated um, from UMT, finishing my PhD in 2016. And within a five year span, uh, I'm lucky to have I'm lucky enough to have published 43 Web of Science papers, where 34 of them are in Q1 and Q2 papers. Um, so for the next slides. So now uh, we know that after we have completed our research and experiment, we ought to get our message, our findings out to the public. Just like how reporters write news articles to report on interesting stories occurring around us, we scientists publish our stories into journals. And the quality of the journals that we'll accept depends greatly on the depth and the quality of our story. So finishing your research is just halfway through the process. The next process is equally important, that is manuscript writing. It is so important that it is the practice of some researchers in other countries and also in, in Malaysia that whoever wrote the whole manuscript deserves to be the first author, whether or not he carried out the whole experiment. This is because you can't really be a researcher if you do not know how to tell the story out to the public. So the knowledge that you uncover would not even spread out and that defeats the purpose of scientific discovery. So before we talk about the worthiness of a research manuscript, let me bring you through on how to first write a proper manuscript. Next slide, please. So um, where do you even start? 
Now, before you start to scribble off writing your paper, you have to use some time to find your story. So what story do you want to tell? And most importantly, to whom you would like to tell them to? And then who is your audience? Now to do this, no one is more qualified than you because you did the whole experiment yourself. Uh, SJ, uh, next slide, please. So before you even started doing the experiment, normally all of us already have hypothesis in mind. And now when everything is completed, your, your research is completed, you have to reflect on what do your results tell you and how can you convey what you find to other members of the community. Like for example, for me, whenever I have a full set of data ready, I'll always question myself, why are these data important? And what can they tell us that no one else can? You have to first convince yourself that the storyline you are making up in your mind is important enough. If you can't convince yourself, then I highly doubt that the reviewers or readers would find your manuscript interesting. Next slide, please. So once you have found and convinced yourself of a good storyline for your manuscript, next is to select an appropriate journal. Now this step is equally important. Never go about writing a manuscript without knowing where you might be submitting it to beforehand. This is because selecting a journal early in the manuscript writing stage, it actually enables us to know which group of audience we are targeting. And most, if not all, journals have specific niche of target audience. For example, in our field within Aquatrop, the most prestigious journal would be Aquaculture, aquaculture nutrition, aquaculture research, aquaculture reports, and also fisheries research. These are just a few examples that researchers in the field of aquaculture mostly devote our, devote our research to. So take aquaculture, for example. If you intend to submit a manuscript to aquaculture, your whole storyline should be tailored specifically to helping the aquaculture community and also in advancing the aquaculture sector. Now, this is important because I've tried submitting a manuscript regarding molecular biology aspects of my crab, but the whole manuscript was written targeting just a general biology audience. And guess what? I get an instant rejection letter from aquaculture. So now when you are selecting an appropriate journal, always look for a journal index in Web of Science. I won't go into detail about predatory journals as this is not the focus today, but I think it will be easier to keep in mind that we should always publish in web or science index journals, no matter how low impact factors they might have. So, and then you should also never be in a rush to publish and just randomly select a journal to submit your manuscript to, because you have to remember that your research once published, it stays online forever. You can't simply retract a paper, even though it is on a predatory journal. So your future generations could even look back into your research. So do you really want your name to be painted in some unknown journals with low credibility? So if you are not sure if a journal is suitable or not, you can always refer to um, to your supervisor or any other lecturers, someone with more experience. And, then, and I believe that um, most of them would be happy to help out with that. Next slide, please. So now after you have a clear mindset of your story and you have selected one or two appropriate journal, now it is time to go through its author guidelines and requirements. This can be easily done by searching for guide to authors at the journal's official webpage. So read through the guide to authors carefully, especially if you have never submitted a manuscript to that journal before. 
this will save you a lot of time because most often than not, manuscripts that are submitted without following the author's guidelines and requirements are instantly rejected. So read through them and understand each terms and requirements carefully. This can be an arduous process, but starting here might save you a great deal of time and effort later on. So although the same information might be present in every set of author guidelines within your subfield, the organization of that information can vary greatly. For example, some journals prefer result, discussion and conclusions to be separated, but others might not. They might want, they might want just one, uh, one clump of result and discussion together. So as much as possible, avoid spending time working on things that you know would make the final cut. Also, some information are crucial when you are preparing your manuscripts, such as is the journal by subscription only, or are they only open access uh, accessible? For example, papers under Frontiers and BMC journals are all only open access. So unless, if your supervisor is willing to pay, then please do not waste time submitting to only open access journals. If not, you'll waste the valuable time of reviewers who all of us have to review papers for free and ended up you won't even publish in that journal because you can't afford to pay the open access fee. Then you, all, you have to also take care of small details in the guidelines, such as section labeling format, citations and reference styles, and also the limits on how many words your manuscript should have or how many tables or figures, and also the quality of the figures. And also most of the journals now will demand a mandatory raw data deposition, or at least you have to deposit this, you have to deposit the data as uh, complementary material. So this is to ensure that there is no falsifying raw data and other researchers could easily assess and reanalyze your data. So make sure you supply it if it is already listed in the author's guideline page. Next slide, please. So now after you have familiarized yourself with the guidelines of the selected journals, you may start the writing process of your manuscript. So based on my experience, it is the easiest to start with writing the methodology section first. This is because you have already done the experiment and all the methods should be fresh in your mind. So writing the method section may also reveal gaps that require more time or further experiments to fill. For example, you may be missing characterization data for a novel compound. So particularly for synthetic work, where you must include characterization data for many compounds and intermediates, Methods can also be one of the longest and most tedious section for you to write. So getting it out of the way at the beginning of the writing process can clear the way for focusing on the rest of the paper. So there are a few important tips though when you are writing in the methodology section. First, you have to be as clear as possible. So after you have done writing the methodology, read it back. A, a methodology section should allow others to fully replicate your experiment just by following what you have described in the methodology section. So every detail matters. How many streams or preps were used? Or how many times were they fed per day? Or how many replicates did you use? And what are the statistical tests used to analyze your data? What was the size of the rearing tank? And how did you maintain constant temperature? So read everything back as though you never did the experiment. Now ask yourself, would you understand what you wrote? So second, all sentences in methodology should always be in past tense because you're already describing what you have done. So I think this is kind of important to always keep in mind when you are writing the methodology section. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, uh, thank you. So after finishing the methodology section, um, then we move on to writing the introduction section. Now the introduction section is unique in that it is possibly the section of the paper that stands alone the best. It is also the only one you may be able to write fully before the last of the experimental work is done. So for this reason, you have the most flexibility with the timing for writing this section. So by writing introduction first, it can actually help you discover the gaps in your knowledge by forcing you to review the relevant literature. So this background may actually inform conclusions you wish to discuss later in the paper. So in brief, the introduction section introduces your topic. It gives a brief overview to readers. What is the general field of research of your manuscript? It also describes the background of the story. Briefly bring readers to what have been done in the past and also what is the missing gap that your story tries to achieve. Now this will subsequently establish your research problem. Then from your research problems, now everything is clear. So from there, you guide the readers to your objectives. And from the objectives, you can either map out your paper or postulate implications that might arise from your study. So all these five points are the common flow of a decent introduction section. And each aspect should be equally emphasized to show to the readers that as the story writer, you indeed know what you are talking about. Next slide, please. So after giving the reader a brief idea of your story and what you are trying to solve via your introduction, now you might move on to writing the results, discussion and conclusion sections. Now, what is the result section and what does it do? Now, the results section of a scientific research paper represents the core findings of your study derived from the methods you applied to gather and analyze information. So it presents these findings in a logical sequence without bias or interpretation from the author. And it actually sets up for the reader for later interpretation and evaluation in the discussion section. So a major purpose of the result section is to actually break down the data into sentences that shows its significance to the research question. So this section essentially answers the basic question of what did you find in your research? Next slide, please. So what is included in the results then? So the results section should include the findings of your study and only that of your, the findings of your study. There won't be any citations normally in this section. So you present your data in tables, charts, graphs and figures, but never repeat that. For example, if the data is already presented in a table form, then you do not need to do another chart for the same data. Next, you need a contextual analysis of this data, analyzing its meaning in sentence form. Now, this is where I notice most students are very weak in. You can't simply restate what is presented in the table. For example, if you have already put the average of male and female of different treatments in a table, you don't need to repeat it using a sentence in the result section. So you could directly state after analysis, what is the trend of the uh, average weight of male and female. So if the scope of the study is broad or has many variables, or if the methodology used yields a wide range of different results, the author should state only those results that are most relevant 
to the research question stated in your introduction section. So as a general rule, any information that does not present the direct findings or outcome of your study should be left out in this section. So unless the author is requested by the journal or advisor to include results and discussion together, explanations and interpretation of these results should also be omitted from the results section. But how do you organize your results? So the best way to organize your results section is logically. One logical and clear method of organizing the results is to provide them alongside your research question and within each research question, present the type of data that address that research question. Next slide, please. So after you have completed the result section, you can immediately move on to the discussion. Now the purpose of the discussion part is to interpret and also describe the significance of your findings in light of what was already known about the research problem being investigated and also to explain any new understanding or fresh insights about the problem after you have taken the findings into consideration. So the discussion will always connect to the introduction by the way of the research question or hypothesis you posed earlier and also the literature that you have reviewed. But it's, it does not simply repeat or rearrange the introduction. The discussion should always explain how your study has moved the reader's understanding of the research problem forward from where you left them at the end of the introduction. So this section, uh, the discussion section, is often considered the most important part of a research paper because it most effectively demonstrates your ability as a researcher to think critically about an issue to develop creative solutions to problems based on the findings, and also to formulate a deeper, more profound understanding of the research pro problem you are studying. So the discussion section is where you explore the underlying meaning of your research, its possible implications in other areas of studies, and the possible improvements that can be made in order to further develop the concerns of your research. This is the section where you need to present the importance of your study and how it may be able to contribute to and also to fill the existing gaps of knowledge in your field. If appropriate, the discussion section is also where you state how the findings from your studies reveal new gaps in the literature that had not been previously exposed or adequately described. So this part of the paper is not strictly governed by objective reporting of information, but rather it is where you can engage in creative thinking about issues through evidence-based interpretations of findings. This is where essentially you infuse your results with meaning. Next slide, please. So um, among the general rules of writing discussion is never to be repetitive. So you do not repeat what is presented in the results and introduction section. Instead of restating, you have to explain the results comment on whether or not the results were expected and also present explanations for the results. Go into greater depth when explaining findings that were unexpected or findings that were especially profound. So if appropriate, note any unusual or unanticipated patterns or trends that emerged from your results and try to explain their meaning behind that. Also, be concise and make your points clearly and avoid using jargon. So when writing the discussion, you should always 
First, reiterate the research problem or you can state the major findings. So briefly reiterate for your readers the research problems you are investigating and the methods you use to investigate them. Then move quickly to describe the major findings of the study. You should write a direct declarative proclamation of the study results. Now second, explain the meaning of the findings and why they are important. No one has thought as long and hard about your study as you have. So systematically explain the meaning of the findings and why you believe they are important. After reading the discussion section, you want the readers to think about the results and actually come up with questions like, oh, why hadn't I thought about that? So now you don't want to force the readers to go through the paper multiple times to figure out what you are actually trying to bring out. So begin this part of the section by restating what you consider to be your most important finding first. Then the third point would be to relate your findings to similar studies. No study is so novel or, pos or possess such a restricted focus that it has absolutely no relation to other previously published research. So the discussion section should relate your study, the findings in your study to those of other studies, particularly if questions raised by previous studies serve as the motivation for your study. Or the findings of other studies supported your findings, which actually strengthened the importance of your study results. And also they point out how your study differs from other similar studies. So a few historical references may be helpful for perspective, but most of the references should be relatively re recent and included to aid in the interpretation of your research and also to link them to similar studies. So if a study that you cited disagrees with your findings, don't ignore it because reviewers were all experts in your field and they would really know what is going on and what is the current trend of that particular research area. So instead, you should clearly explain why the findings of that study differ from the finding of yours. Number four would be to consider alternative explanations of the findings. So it is important to remember that the purpose of the research is to discover and not to prove. So when writing the discussion section, you should carefully consider all possible explanations for the study results, rather than just choosing those that fit your prior assumptions or bias. Because what you are doing here is to actually discover new knowledge. And number five would be to acknowledge your study's limitations. Now, all studies have limitations. So it is far better for you to identify and acknowledge your own study's limitations than to have them pointed out by your reviewers. So describe the generalizability of your results to other situations and if applicable to the method chosen, then describe in detail problems you encountered in the methods you use to get the information. Also, you should note any unanswered questions or issues your study did not have time or have the resources to address. Now, lastly, you should also make suggestions for future research. So although your study may often may offer important insights about the research problems. Other questions related to the problem would likely remain unanswered. So moreover, some unanswered questions may have become more focused because of your study. So you should make suggestions for further research in the discussion section. Next slide, please. So after everything, you need to conclude your research. Concluding paragraphs should be clear and sum up what you have presented in your research without, without sounding redundant. An effective concluding paragraph can also add impact to what you have presented in your paper. 
So if the argument or point of your paper is complex, you may need to summarize the argument for your reader. If prior to your conclusions, you have not yet explained the significance of your findings, or if you are proceeding inductively, use the end of your paper to describe your main points and explain their significance. Move from a detail to a general level of consideration that returns the topic to the context provided by the introduction or within a new context that emerges from your data. So state your conclusions in clear and simple language. Do not simply reiterate your results or the discussion. You should identify opportunities for future research as long as you have, haven't already done so in the in discussion section of your paper. Next slide, please. So after you have write the introduction to conclusion, finally, there comes the time to assemble all of the pieces. So read over the combined manuscript to ensure that there is a proper flow between the sections. Fill in any missing gaps or add in any missing transitions. So once a draft of the manuscript is complete, write a strong abstract that adequately describes what the paper covers and why it is important and noble. So an abstract summarizes, usually in one paragraph of 300 words or less, depending on journals, the major aspects of the entire paper in a prescribed sequence that includes the overall purpose of your study and the research problem you investigated, the basic design of your study, the major findings or trends found as a result of your analysis, and also a brief summary of your interpretations and conclusions. So how do you know when you have enough information in your abstract? A simple rule of thumb is to imagine that you are another researcher doing a similar study. Then ask yourself, if your abstract was the only part of the paper you could access, would you be happy with the amount of information presented there? Does it tell the whole story of your study? And if the answer is no, then the abstract that you wrote would likely need to be revised. Next slide, please. So finally, revisit the author's guidelines again. Be sure to complete any additional sections, such as supplementary information, author's contributions, conflict of interest, and, and others that are required by the journals where you plan to submit. So you always have to remember to ask yourself, are all the author's name correctly spelled? And you have to check with the each author's co-authors personally. I have seen cases where researchers' names are spelled wrongly, and it is not a simple error that you can rectify by just retracting the journal. So this only also reflects on how little effect you actually put into the manuscript, that you don't even care to validate your co-authors' names. And remember, once it is published, you can't really do anything about it anymore. So after that, check if all the affiliations are listed. Now for this, you need to ask each author if they have other affiliations that they might want to be listed. Also, have you acknowledged all grants? And have you prepared the cover letter? Some journals have specific format for this and you need to follow them strictly. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. So once you have checked um, all the author's guideline, so let's uh, flash back. So there, there are basically eight bas basic steps for you to write a good manuscripts. First <coughs> is to find your story. Second, select an appropriate journal. And this is to ensure that you have the correct audience. Next, go through the author guidelines and requirements. And then start writing uh, from the methodology section. And then followed by results, 
<coughs> introduction, results, discussion, and conclusions. And after that, assemble all sections and finally write the abstract. So once we have the whole manuscript ready, <coughs> recheck again all the logis logistical details. Uh, next slide, please. So now the manuscript is ready, <coughs> but then again, is it? Do you think that it is now worthy of publications? <coughs> so what actually makes your manuscript stands out that it warrants a publication at a specific journals? And how outstanding does your manuscript needs to be? And what do you think reviewers are looking for in the manuscript? Next slide, please. So articles worthy of publication in a particular journal must contain material consistent with the mission and scope of the chosen journal. So the content for all refereed journals should be presented with semantic consistency. <coughs> so semantic consistency here refers to the soundness of your idea, specified with evidence to support the author's position, with proper attributions of quoted material. And it is important to uh, avoid plag uh, plagiarizing. <coughs> so reviewers gouge the soundness of ideas in two major sections, your introduction and also your discussion. In the introduction section, <coughs> they'll go through your introduction and try to figure out were your ideas being postulated based on a strong background of evidences? And how important and relevant are your ideas to the field of study? And in the discussion section, <coughs> a sound discussion often relates your results to the pool of knowledge currently available. So <coughs> is your results expected? If it does not go according to plan, what do you think caused the deviation? And do you have any strong supporting evidence? So next, the idea should be presented with carefully chosen words in language that reveals the meanings of the subjects of the paper while adhering still to the principles of discourse. So a discourse is a, word, is a body of text meant to communicate specific data, information, and knowledge. <clears throat> and the discussion you are writing is meant to be a scientific discourse. So you need to argue and convince yourself that how you end up with the results and also what do they imply. Next slide, please. <coughs> so another important characteristics of a good manuscript is one with logical co coherence. So logical coherence includes clarity, format and structure. Clarity refers to the precise articulation of the purpose of the article. The readers must be able to ascertain what the author is planning to convey. Precise articulation means attention to the rules of good writing. The who, what, where, and when rules must be honored, and often also why such material is being presented. Normally, the first sentence or two should state the purpose of the article. A normal flow from one sentence to the next is essential, along with deliberate transitions between paragraphs. Now, format is a template <coughs> and is important in that it provides a focus for the reader to follow throughout the paper. The format consists of the headings, that are pauses to announce movement to the next idea, but still focus on the main topic of the paper. Structure is the order in which the material is presented. A decision must be made by the author on how to present conceptual, theoretical, and empiric empirical evidence to support the premise of the manuscript, to make it comprehensive and conducive to understanding the intent of the material. 
and the author must <coughs> align the evidence with the most appropriate areas of discussion and also in the appropriate tone. Next slide, please. So for a scientific article to have scientific merit, it is important that the study should be reported accurately and honestly. Thus, it must include an explanation of the phenomenon under study, the research question, a review of the extent literature across disciplines, the method and detailed designs of the study, a description of the execution of the studies, in which includes procedures, data get gathering and analysis, reliable and valid instruments, <coughs> and others, details about animal sampling work and also culturing, the findings of the study with a connection to the theoretical framework, and the description of new knowledge emanating from the study with implications for further research. In short, accuracy, honesty, and reproducibility are the three components reviewers would seek in reading your manuscript. And this ultimately determines if your manuscript is worthy or not for publications. Next slide, please. <coughs> so I bet all of us have read through research papers. And you realize that some papers are mediocre at, it, at its best, some are really bad, and then there are some that are really good that you have no problem reading it, even just glancing it through for one time. So reading a well-written research paper is not only enjoyable, it is also a passive learning that helps you write better papers for yourself. So reading and writing are tightly coupled processes that support each other. Reading actually creates a basis for writing. So it helps you passively build up your scientific vocabulary and to assimilate the writing styles and conventions. So it is a source that you can tap into as you write and it is the input. Whereas writing <coughs> is your output. So when you, are, when you write, you are combining words and phrases you know from reading into a new and unique mixture. So to make your manuscript worthy of publications, find some really good papers to read and to follow. Papers in established journals and also those preferably in high impact journals. Then learn from them how they synthesize ideas, how they design their experiment and also how they frame their story. <coughs> Next slide. So that concludes a little sharing session from me today about how to actually um, write a manuscript worthy of publications. So do you have any <coughs> questions? <coughs> so I have one from Iqbal. Uh, will Web of Science Journal accept simple analysis of data like descriptive analysis and regression or do they just accept <coughs> complicated kind of analysis well i think uh, analysis um, statistical analysis is just a tool so how you interpret your data and <coughs> how strong is your statistical analysis in making sure that your data <coughs> your analysis is valid is actually more important than <coughs> what tests you are using. So for example, you could use a simple ANOVA or t-test, but what your what your finding or what your stories are trying, what you are trying to tell with your stories is actually captivating to the audience, then you will have no problems publishing in a web of science journal. But yes, of course, <coughs> it also goes where how uh, how complicated is your analysis? <coughs> and you actually have to understand what, what is the function of the analysis that you chose to do. 
So I think it, it brings back to the question where <coughs> uh, it is important for us to actually read and follow through from previous published journals. Look at how, let's say if they have similar um, scenarios or similar uh, sampling strategies as yours, how do they analyze their data? So do they use uh, the same data analysis that you use? And if they, are use a, if they are using a different one, why do you think uh, they are using that specific analysis compared to yours? And then you should also read through their results, their descriptions of results, and also their discussions on how they actually um, bring out the data analysis uh, part and how they incorporate it into their storytelling. <coughs> So uh, to re-answer your question, I think statistical analysis, uh, the complication, the level of complication of the analysis that you chose would not ultimately determine if it gets accepted in Web of Science Journal. And I think what is more important is how we tell the story. <coughs> and also I have another question uh, from Haris Suradi. So does the length of manuscript guarantee the quality? Now, in short, no. The length of manuscript does not guarantee the quality. Just like, <coughs> excuse me, just like how you tell a story, the length of your story does not guarantee the quality of your story. So an important, an important key point for a really good and charming storyteller would be choosing what to tell the audience. You can have a lot of ideas in your mind, but you need to actually synthesize, okay, in this paragraph, what do you want to selectively tell the audience? So that goes back to our presentation of who our audience is. So once you have select your audience, let's say if you are only talking to aquaculturists and fish farmers, then your introduction section and your discussion section should also tailor to that specific niche of audience. And then how long if your, is your story actually depends on the quality of your discussion and your introduction. It can go on very long and you can just quote and quote other research papers, but it doesn't, if it doesn't reflect on uh, a solid discussion, then mostly reviewers will just ask you to trim down all your discussion into a simple two or three sentences. So yes, the length of manuscript does not guarantee quality. For example, you can also look at uh, good and high impact papers like <coughs> those papers published in Nature and Science. They have a really short um, manuscript length because everything else is already synthesized in the supplementary material. So they just want their story to be able to tell their story across to readers in the most simplified form. So it does not guarantee that the longer the paper you write, the better quality it is. Yes, I think uh, <coughs> for the sharing of slides, I think it should be no problem. Uh, and also I think there will be a sharing of this um, recording in Aquatrop's Facebook, I think. Uh, and then I have finished all the questions in the chat box. So if anyone has any questions, you're most welcome to just uh, on the speaker and then just voice out. Uh, I have one question, doctor. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. So I have actually something I want to know. Yes. Uh, first, I want to know about the authors and their affiliation. I have some of my friends, they already completed their master's <coughs> from uh, university, Bangladesh Research <coughs> University, but they have their thesis and they have data, they are interested to publish with me, <coughs> and they are also doing some job in government office. So what will be their affiliation and is it possible to publish after degree? Uh, I want to know about the affiliation, about the, what will be the affiliation in this case like this. Yes. Because uh, they graduated from the master's or PhD <coughs> and they already joined in the job, but they are interested because they want to continue further study in future. Yes, yeah. thank you, Asman. So I think 
for such a scenario, I think it is quite common. So what researchers normally do is, first, you have to affiliate where the research was conducted. So basically, like in your case, then it will be the first affiliation would be um, the previous university way where they have did their bachelor degree. And then you can follow up with a second affiliation where they are, uh, where they are working now. So they can have two or three affiliations under the, uh, under the same author. <clears throat> so I hope I answer your question. Yeah, That's another fine. one about the keywords. Uh, actually, I, so I, uh, as I know, <clears throat> the keywords is it independent about the abstract or I can choose the keywords by myself. Any, any keywords or I should be choose from the abstract or from the title about the keywords. Yes, uh, in regarding to keywords, they are different format for different journals. So what are keywords? Keywords are actually uh, a few words. Normally it's five to six chosen words by us, where it will facilitate an easier searching of the journal when people type in any search machine like Google. So some of the, some of the papers, uh, some of the journals actually require us to chose a different keywords that are found in the title, some is okay. So um, the reason for them to ask us to choose a different keyword with what are the words already used in the title is to actually to uh, enlarge the search scope for your paper. For example, if your paper already has uh, the mating of crab, then if you put keyword uh, if you put mating as a keyword, then it will be redundant with your title. So of course, people, if they search mating crap, it will come up with your paper. But let's say if you can put uh, gonad maturation, then instead of just mating, they have another keywords of choice that is gonad maturation, where if they type in gonad maturation and crap, it will come up with your paper as well. So it, it actually benefits us researchers when we are publishing so that it increases the uh, the search scope of our paper. So if possible, if you can think of other keywords, uh, you can always uh, refrain from using the same wording that has already been used in your title. <coughs> and I have another question from Chatbox. <coughs> so what about a uh, review paper? Do you have any tips for review paper? Thank you. Well, um, basically review paper, they have different types of review paper. So the traditional one is called narrative review paper, where we basically uh, synthesize based on our knowledge and based on the published papers, what are the uh, current development within a specific scope. And then now there are also systematic review paper, where you have actually, you have to go through search engines and then there are proper methods to do uh, a systematic review paper. So it depends on review paper, but basically review paper is still an article. So it does follow the standard format. It will have an introduction section. And also it will have, if you are doing a narrative review, then it will have a large chunk of a discussion section where you actually synthesize what you want to discuss into different subtopics and bring out to the to the readers um, what are the relevant progress or what uh, or what are the points that you want to talk about and then it will also end with a conclusion and also a future prospect section okay <coughs> so good afternoon uh, is open access or closed access uh, I think you mean by subscription is recommended to publish a manuscript. <coughs> it depends on several factors. Uh, first, of course, it depends on your funding. If you have the capacity, then of course, open access would be a better choice because once you pay the open access fee, then everyone can access your paper without, uh, without having to pay any, uh, any cent. But if you don't have uh, funding as your choice, then you may opt for subscription-based paper. And most paper now, they actually offer both options. For example, like in aquaculture, 
they are by subscription, but if you have the funding, you can also choose to publish it uh, open access. And uh, another important point is that some of the some of the predatory journals actually uses open access as a platform to uh, generate more revenue for them. So some of these are uh, uh, like AACL Bioflux and some, some of the journals in MDPI. So it is also, I think open access or not is a second question, but to publish a manuscript, I think you have to background check the journal that you are going to publish into first, whether that journal is actually a prestigious journal in your field. And that is easily, you can easily do that in uh, the JCR function, uh, journal citation report, where you can actually look at the trends and also the ranking of journals in a specific field. <clears throat> and can journals from late 90s still be used as reference? Yes, uh, this is a good question because <clears throat> it actually depends on what you are talking about. For example, uh, I have a review paper on um, a parasite from a uh, parasite in crab. So when when we are doing when we were doing the review, uh, my co-authors actually suggested that we have to cite not just uh, citations from the late nineties, but we have citations from late seventies and so on. Because it depends on what you are talking about. Some of some of the sentences that you use might actually one references uh, that that first started to reference them. For example, the, uh, the finding of a novel species. You need to cite the first paper that actually reported. So that paper might be in the 1950s, 1960s, but nevertheless, you should cite that paper first instead of all the other later papers that do works on the same species. And then maybe after that, you can refer to some of the more la latest uh, publications on on that specific topic. So it depends on uh, it greatly depends on the scope and the uh, the essence of what you are talking about. Let's say if you are talking about the progress in a specific field, then you would also want to include one or two references from the early early starting of that field, some from the mid uh, mid progress, and also some from the latest. 2000 or 2021. <clears throat> I think, yes, I think that answers, I hope that it answers your questions. Dr. Dr. Wai Ho? Yes. Okay, I, have a, I have one question. Uh, can you uh, explain more about the conflict of interest? What the, the meaning of that? Sometimes we don't really understand about the conflict of interest. Yes, <clears throat> normally uh, in most uh, not most, but in all, all papers that we, all manuscript that we submit to journals, we actually have to declare if we have a conflict of interest. But in most of our case, we would not have any conflict of interest among the authors. <clears throat> conflict of interest actually, if I'm not mistaken, it actually stands for if, uh, let's say, if uh, someone is working, one of your co-authors is a uh, an editor in in aquaculture journal, and then he is also publishing. Then there will be a conflict of interest in he being an editor for aquaculture and publishing in aquaculture. So you have to declare that so that when aquaculture is looking for reviewer or looking for editor, they will note this and also to prevent him from being an editor, so on. And also there's conflict of interest in uh, in grants and so on, because some grants might uh, might have specific terms and conditions where they don't actually allow you to publish, and then you have to actually sign the conflict of interest uh, to declare it before you publish. So, do you, do we have any other questions that I might? help to clear some if uh, another one uh, uh, way home. 
Yes. If we have uh, so many uh, uh, comment from reviewer, yeah. So, so you need to uh, answer all the comment. <laughs> Some, yes. Yeah. So many, but yeah, difficult to fulfill the the what what they want. So how to uh, reply to them? I think uh, the most polite way to address reviewers. Uh, reverse uh, comment is to actually reply each and every one of the questions and then uh, normally how we do it it depends greatly between among people but how normally I do it is read through each question and specifically answer every one of the question although the same question have been posed by reviewer one and reviewer two maybe it's the same question then you can just kindly restate that um, similar question have been asked by reviewer one, but then you should also still answer that question for reviewer two as well. <clears throat> and yes, you have, it is polite for you to answer all questions, even if those questions, uh, even if you are trying, if you, even if you are not incorporating uh, any amendments for that question and you are trying to rebut it, you should also include uh, a logical and also a sensible explanation to the to the reviewer telling them why do you think that question uh, that suggestion should not be incorporated so i think yes uh, we have to address each and every one of the reviewer question i think i have uh, i i have answered some really really long reviewer response where my response to reviewers takes up i think like around 60 pages of the word document so that is just my response to reviewer uh, question so it's question and answer and question and answer so that already takes up 60 pages so yes you actually have to answer because as a reviewer myself we will look back at each question and then we will actually go through each question and answer to see if uh, the uh, the authors actually understand uh, our question and that is one and also to see if if the authors incorporate what we suggest and if not if they are not incorporating it then what would the what would the explanation be so if you are skipping questions from the reviewers then it might show it might show to the reviewer that you are just selectively choosing what question to answer and that is that is really really not good so i think it is really important for you to go through all the questions and answer each and every one of the questions and then if possible you can also uh, refer what i did is i always refer to my answer with my text so you just you, you don't just write like uh, i have incorporated the revision but you actually need to tell the reviewer like after you incorporate the revision what is the new what is the new answer that you incorporated into so the reviewers don't actually need to flip through your new manuscript and then go find it one by one. Yeah, and then uh, there's another question. Uh, how you face paper rejection? I think uh, that's an important question. Uh, paper rejections are just like normal rejections you get from date. So how do you face rejection? It's simple, if you get it frequently then like for us, when we get a rejection uh, from a journal, what we think would be first to go through the reviewer comments to see if there are actually some, are there any loopholes or are there any missing gaps that we failed to notice, but the reviewer found it out. And then you should always work on this missing gap first before you resubmit it to another journal. So paper rejection is actually a good thing. It actually tells you that your manuscript is not ready to publish and it actually it also prepares your paper uh, it actually helps you to prepare your paper making it um, more presentable and also uh, making it more worthy of publication so yeah so how do you face it i think just take it as it comes and and i think just embrace the rejection and move on yeah. So in addition to Web of Science and Scopus, 
Are there any good source to publish? Thank you. Uh, uh, personally, I would only recommend Web of Science. Like Scopus is the standard for, I think, Southeast Asia. But compare, comparing Web of Science and Scopus, uh, for now, Web of Science is the highest standards of publication. So I think if you are able to then just aim for Web of Science because that will bring a lot of weightage into your paper compared to if that paper is only published, is only indexed in Scopus, but if it's not indexed in Web of Science. Yeah, so uh, are there any other good sources to publish besides these two? I don't think so. And if possible, you should. I think everyone should just focus on Web of Science Index Journal. You can just search through Web of Knowledge, and if that journal is, you can find it in Web of Knowledge, then it is indexed in Web of Science. And then, um, do you refer to JCR or MJL Clevy? I think these two are the same thing. So you can just use Journal Citation Report, or an easier and even easier way is after you have known your journal, let's say if you want to publish in aquaculture, most of the journal they will put uh, they will put in their website where they are indexed in. So you can just find index in and then there will be a list of their uh, index outlet for let's say for aquaculture, then they'll have scopus, web of science and so on. So that, that is another way, that will be an easier way. So can you share tips on how to train your or our own postgraduate students to write good manuscript? <clears throat> I think training training would be a quite uh, quite uh, a word of uh, heavy weightage. I think how how postgraduate students can learn to write good manuscripts, it all depends on the effort that you put in. Like uh, when you look around, um, people's that, people that publish in papers, they actually spend a lot, a lot of time reading and polishing up their English and um, getting to know what are the current trends, uh, constantly update, updating themselves with what is happening around their field and so on. So how to write a good manuscript, it goes back to uh, what I've said before. It goes back to reading. So what you read actually dictates how you write. So how can we actually write a good manuscript? So first you have to know how to identify a good manuscript. So once you can identify a good manuscript, read it and then dissect it, how, how they actually write that manuscript that makes you want to read it more. And then, then you, can, you can actually follow on their writing styles, their writing choice of vocabulary, and so on, and actually uh, incorporate this into your writing. So it's it's not plagiarizing, but you are actually adapting and learning new ways of explaining the same sentences over and over again. So I think if you want tips, I think the most important tips would be the students themselves should put enough effort into writing. So for them to actually have a good baseline for writing a good manuscript, first they need to go through reading, read really good manuscripts, papers that are in uh, top journals in Web of Science. Those are really, that, those actually gives a lot of sense on how to actually write uh, manuscripts worthy for publications. Yeah. So, does anyone have any other questions? Okay, Doctor, I have one more question. That one is a citation. Yes. If yes. I want to publish in Web of Science uh, Index Journal, so yes. about the citation source, should I follow all the citation from Web of Science Journal or Scopus, or can I? That means the minimum standard uh, of the citation journal so that I can publish in the Web in Science Index Journal. Suppose I want to publish in Q1 Journal, so can I select the papers from Q4 or Q5 or Q3 like that? 
Yes, that's an inter interesting question. I have actually asked that question before when I was studying. So the answer that I get from some uh, really good writer is that <coughs> what you are writing and what you are citing are actually scientific knowledge. So it does not matter if that knowledge comes from um, uh, a web of science Q4 or Q1 journal, as long as it is scientific knowledge, then you should acknowledge it. However, it is important for you to remember that you have to read through the whole study. If the whole study, the methodology of that study uh, raises red flag, for example, if you, are, you yourself are not even sure that the method the study used is actually reliable, then you shouldn't cite it. If not, I think you should cite uh, papers no matter if they are only in Scopus or if they are in Q4 or Q1 paper. But um, what most of us do is uh, we'll look for Q1 paper first, but if they are limited info and then they are some really good papers but published in Q4, then of course you can use them as well. There are no, there are no rules saying that you can't. But if the papers are published in predatory journal, then you should then you should really take care of whether to cite or not to cite that paper. Because if you have doubts on uh, the consistency and also the reliability of the data itself and how they process that data, then I think you should just omit that out of your citation. And then uh, any tips to choose the most suitable publisher for our research study? Um, no, you don't really choose the publisher, you choose the journal. So your target um, before writing, you should actually have several journals that you want to publish in mind. So how do we choose the journals? It is actually based on reading as well. So let's say if you are doing something about crab culture, because that is my field. So if you are doing something on crab culture, if you read and read a lot about crab culture studies in, in uh, online, then you will find that most of the studies are published in Journal of Crustacean Biology, Aquaculture, Hydrobiology, um, Estuarine, Coastal and Shelf Science. So if you read enough papers, you already have a rough mindset of where to publish your papers, uh, uh, where to publish your papers to. So uh, I think uh, choosing journals will be more important than choosing publisher. But some publisher might uh, not be credible, so you have to be aware of that. But so far, big publishers like El Xavier, Taylor & Francis, um, really all these are uh, credible publishers. And what is your opinion on manuscript-based uh, thesis? I think um, manuscript-based manuscript thesis are okay as long as, uh, well, you can't actually copy and paste, for example, three manuscripts into one thesis. Your thesis actually has, a own, has its own storyline. And you have to make sure that that storyline is being told specifically within that th thesis in itself. So let's say if some of the data in the manuscript are not really fitting into the story of the thesis, then I think you should omit that data and make sure that the storyline of the thesis are still well in line and it actually answers to your uh, main thesis uh, title. So can a journal quality be judged based on the number of self citation? Many of these are the reasons why <coughs> there is discontinuous or scopus coverage. However, it's just part of the reason. <coughs> uh, I think it... <coughs> It goes back to uh, the paper itself. So uh, just like the question on uh, the citation, should you cite a Q4 paper or paper without impact factor? It, it, it actually goes back to um, the research paper itself. So you have to actually go through the research paper because I have found many papers uh, published in Q4 journals with zero point something impact factor but their, the work that they do is really, really good. So it, because uh, getting paper published, it actually depends on where you submit it to. 
So let's say if the authors directly submit it to a low impact factor journal, then of course it will get um, published. And if it get published in a low impact journals, that would not um, warrant, that would not be a, re uh, a, a reason for us not to cite it. So I think it depends greatly on how good is the paper itself. So it, for example, like what you are saying, for example, if like this year, marine biotechnology has no impact factor at all because of self-citation problem. But I have a paper in marine biotechnology previously. So, and then uh, there are still publications in marine biotechnology and most of them are really good uh, research questions and with solid methodology and so on. So I think it shouldn't deter you from judging, but let's say if you are if, if you are a postgraduate student, then that might be one of the factors where to publish your journal because uh, requirement for researchers and postgraduate students may maybe uh, you need to publish in a Q1 or Q2 journal. And if that journal is already has a discontinued uh, Scopus coverage, then it might not do you good. But uh, you can't really judge a journal quality based on uh, based on the number of self citation, I think. So since uh, <coughs> there's another question, since we cannot simply cancel our submitted manuscript to targeted journal, how to overcome the <coughs> the late <coughs> reply of the journal? Because I have submitted to certain journal, and it take five to six months, and there are still no response. Is it okay to just cancel it and send it to other journal, or via compulsory to wait until the journal reply? I think uh, the decent approach would be if you are emailing to the editor and there's no reply from the editor, then I think you can try to email the editorial office. And I think five to six months is, uh, is normal now, I think for, uh, especially during COVID, but you should get a reply from the editorial office. And if you really decide to retract it, you should also, uh, get a response from the editorial office as well so as not to be rude because um, you might want to submit other papers to that same journal again in the future but uh, i think if i'm not sure but if there's uh, a function for you to retract your journal uh, your paper while waiting then you can try that but i because so far i have never retracted any paper so <laughs> Uh, I've waited for, I think, more than eight months, though, for some. But I think you can try to email uh, the editorial office if the editor is not responding. <coughs> so I think that's all. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? If not, I think uh, just a kind of reminder for our cultural postgraduate, I think or for all the audience, you can fill in the attendance form. <coughs> and there's another one. If a manuscript is published on a Scopus journal, but you can't tell the Scopus coverage duration, but then it happens a month later, then suddenly you realize that they discontinued for publication concerns. Few weeks later, they updated it saying that the final coverage on June and someone get accepted. <coughs> it feels very unfair to those who get published after June until January, what to do? <coughs> yes, um, I think that is life. So you can't really do much about that because you are already in the process of uh, reviewing and then um, uh, revision and getting in the process of submission. So uh, it will be, I think it will be rude as well for you to retract that paper. I think it is the same case like, <clears throat> let's say if I submit the paper now and then uh, it goes under review and under re revision and then when it get published in August, let's say, uh, the impact factor of the paper that I targeted, let's say now it's impact factor two. And then by August, by June, they have a new impact factor. But then the impact factor dropped to 0 0.5. So should you retract the journal, uh, the paper? No, because 
as a courtesy, it, you have already gone through the whole process. So it is actually quite <laughs> rude for you to actually retract it. But I think you can, you can actually email them to ask if uh, are they able to uh, allow you to retract it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that is one of the problems, especially in big papers. Like uh, previously, last year, I think there's a few papers that, that are related in our, to our field that get retracted. Uh, and they don't have impact factor anymore, such as fish and shellfish immunology, zoo, I think zootexa and marine biotechnology. So, yeah. but uh, I have friends that are still publishing in that paper. So, yeah, I think they will get their impact factor back, but maybe, uh, maybe they will have to wait for one or two years. So does anyone has any more questions? So I think we can close our session, Doctor. Yes, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have come to the end. Uh, so our grateful thank you to Dr. Kowaiho for being our speaker today and to all uh, our fellow audience who have come to join this program, thank you so much. Okay, wa billahi taufiq wa hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me.